On this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by First Fidelity Bank, we jump right into local college football news by recapping OU's 48 to nothing win over Missouri State. In the National College Football Roundup, we discuss the rest of the Big 12's awful weekend and update you on the latest developments in the Big 10. We give you our winners and losers of the weekend and wet the beak with the Monday night football doubleheader. Then, we discuss the interesting proposal to convert the Cox Convention Center into a TV and movie studio in Keeping It Local. Please download and subscribe to the podcast, rate it five stars, and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right. I'm man Michael Hostie. We'll kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Monday, September 14th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by First Fidelity Bank. First Fidelity Bank is a full-service financial institution based in Oklahoma with tailored solutions for all your personal and business needs, checking accounts, saving accounts, home loans, and much more. They do it all, whether it's online banking from your computer or mobile banking from your phone. Everything is stress-free with FFB. Making mobile deposits, paying bills online, and moving money to different accounts couldn't be easier. First Fidelity Bank provides free ATMs worldwide, making banking convenient wherever you are. They also give back to the community. FFB donates a total of more than $500,000 to local charities and educational foundations, and they have a special offer for our listeners, Ted, our listeners only. Visit ffb.com slash win. That's ffb.com slash win to enter to win an OKC Energy FC prize pack that includes four tickets to the home game on September 27th, four OKC Energy scarves, ooh, that's fancy, and an OKC Energy jersey. You have until September 23rd to enter, and FFB will pick a winner September 24th. Make your life easier and go bank at First Fidelity Bank. How about that offer? Let's go. I love it. I've been scanning the comment sections uh, of our tweets and stuff like that. We've got a lot of hooligans out there, so this is going to be perfect. Great hooligans. <laughs> now, we're recording this on Sunday night during the middle of the Rams and Cowboys games. So we have Do we not have... update me as that game is going on. I'm recording. Okay, so your DVR, that's fair. I am here salivating over Sean McVay's <laughs> offensive system, watching him run wide zone. It may or may not get me more excited than it should, and I would have given both of my testicles to play <laughs> in that system. In fact, when I got cut by the Browns in 2017, I called the Rams offensive line coach who coached me in Buffalo, Aaron Cromer, and begged him <laughs> to get me there to play in that system for a preseason game and he tried like hell yeah he, he was tried so and tried they and did that at washington for a long time whenever he was there things like the tight ends coach or something uh for the redskins and that's what he was doing there for sure yeah. they were they did that for a long time so cromer tried and tried and tried it was keeping me updated like he's texting me like every hour on the hour and I'm like okay it's gonna happen it's gonna happen and then he goes the GM just doesn't like you man I was like oh I was heartbroken I was heartbroken but all right so we've watched so much football in the last two days I don't know about you Teddy but with the late kickoff last night for OU and so I was able to watch football all day Saturday first on TV then in person then I got home and watched Kansas you know be Kansas but I, I almost feel like overwhelmed by the amount of football I've watched. It was like we had nothing because there was no preseason. It was kind of spotty with college. And then all of a sudden, boom, all in our face all at once. I, I think I just need a breather. This podcast, recording this podcast is giving me the necessary football. You need a bye need week? A, you need yeah. a bye week? <laughs> Thank God we got one coming. Hey, I, I'll tell you what's interesting, though. I agree. I watched a ton of football as well, but I mean, it's kind of nice whenever it was really just the big 12 and ACC going, 
I mean, think about it. You had three power five conferences that didn't play any football at all, which is weird and just lets you know how much football is actually out there and how much isn't happening right now. Right. And it was, it was weird, but I didn't like miss it per se. I, hey, I, I'll say this. I love that uh, the big 12 had the spotlight and, you know, we did something good with it. We lost the two crappy uh, non-Power 5 teams. I, they're not crappy. They're both actually pretty good. But still, that's embarrassing. Yeah. I, I, I love how you're just we'll, – we'll get to all of that. Let's, <laughs> let's go through the OU stuff first. Uh, so let's get to the local college football news. Guys, stop acting like you're too manly and just accept it. Hard seltzers are amazing. There's only one hard seltzer that we drink on this podcast, and that is Will and Wiley Hard Seltzer from Coop Aleworks. It's perfect for any occasion. We drink it by the pool, at the lake, and at the tailgate. I see you, all those people at the Greek houses in Norman. <laughs> not, a, not, not listening to anyone. It's made in Oklahoma, and it's absolutely delicious. Will and Wiley is customized for the Oklahoma lifestyle. Go find it right now in a store near you, and go follow them on social media at, at Will and Wiley. If you're drinking some because of us, Tag us in your social media posts to let them know. Okay, recapping what can be described as, I, I mean, wasn't even a glorified scrimmage, if we're being, an, being honest. There's, there's high school teams in the state of Texas that can beat that Missouri State team. So let's preface all our comments with that. We saw a lot of other teams across the country, though, struggle play just mistake ridden football and oh you played pretty clean so that's that's where I wanted to start is we are we are not oblivious to the fact that they played a really 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 shitty football team but they won 48 to nothing and you're really never going to complain about that it could have been way worse we can acknowledge that as well but Teddy this is how I figured we'll do it we'll do it We'll look at the offense. We'll look at the defense. We will, you know, we will compliment them. We'll criticize them. We'll just do what we normally do. Does that sound like a solid plan? Because this is the first time we've done a game recap. I love it. I'm, I'm down. I'm ready to go. Okay. We're going to start with the important people, people that play offense. No offense, Teddy. <laughs> but the story's Rattler, right? I mean, Spencer Rattler, he looked good. He did, what, 290, four touchdowns. Just such a naturally gifted thrower of the football. I was really impressed by some of his touch on some of those deep balls, uh, especially the one to Mims, the one to Rambo. The, those, the, the way he just flicks it, man, it just looks effortless coming out of his hand. And I thought, even though it was against Missouri State, being your first college start, he handled himself very, very well. And the one thing that stood out to me is he's not a big rah-rah guy. I thought he may be kind of like a beat your chest type of guy, throw a touchdown. And he was like throwing touchdowns, walking to the sidelines, sitting on the bench. Like he was very even keel. And I was really impressed. I was really impressed. I guess one criticism a couple times, maybe he dropped his eyes when he felt some pressure in the pocket. Maybe. But even in those situations, there was a couple times where he did that and he realized he was doing it, got his eyes back downfield and delivered a strike. So overall, I mean, the guy had three incompletions. Two of them were dropped touchdowns. So, I mean, there's really not much you can say. He, he played pretty, pretty damn well, Ted. No, he looked good. Um, I thought he showed great poise. You know, there was a couple of times, as you talked about, where – I think that he had good protection and, you know, read one wasn't there, read two wasn't there. And then just the natural panic hits, you know, that you're supposed to start trying to escape at this point, but he didn't need to, he could have sat in there. And um, I think he, he kind of ran into the back of some guys there. I think was really probably what caused a couple of those sacks, but that's some of those things that are that are going to get cleaned up, and he'll get used to that once he sees it on film, starts to build that trust with his offensive line. You know, he, he's got great weapons to throw to. They were wide open all night. He didn't miss any throws. Um, he hit that's Stogner. A, that's a good point. Yeah, he didn't yeah. miss any. Yeah, Didn't miss any. He hit Stogner down there. Should have been an easy touchdown. 
threw it high, let him, you know, over the defender, you know, where, where he's got a good shot at it. And, you know, Stogner makes that catch, you know, nine times out of 10 went through his hands. It was a little hot, but you still should bring that pass in. I know that brought you physical pain when Stodkowski didn't bring that one because I could. You were so ready to celebrate on the I radio was, call. You were ready, man. I was. They split him out and run it just for him down there in the red zone. And you hate whenever you miss opportunities like that because it gets shuffled to the back. You know, we didn't capitalize on it, and that's how it works. Offensive football, they're not as likely to run it. You know, if it's a guaranteed touchdown, you'll see it every week. But, um, you know. Back to Rattler, though, I thought all in all it was a it was a good performance. Now, here's what's interesting to me. He the numbers were great. He was flawless, but I still am like, eh, eh. Which is Lincoln Riley's fault. You know, that this is all Lincoln Riley's fault. Our expectations Lincoln fault. are Lincoln's fault. This isn't our fault, it's his fault. Right. I mean, Jalen Hurts and his uh debut had what six total touchdowns you know baker mayfield lincoln riley or uh lincoln riley uh uh kyler murray were unbelievable in their debuts i'm used to that and this is the worst team that any of them faced so By i've far. kind of i've kind of built all of that in so i will say that while he looked great i'm not like oh my god heisman trophy here we come it was a great start. I've got nothing negative to say about it, but you know, the beast that Lincoln has created, that's what's expected. Yeah. I mean, we, we are the way we are because of what we've seen lately. I, I do want to get to the other guys on the offense, but can we just point, point out the fact that Missouri state's depth chart is a load of shit. Those guys were tiny. I couldn't see it nearly as good as you could because I was I was up in the up in the box. Whoever put that depth chart together with those heights and weights, especially along the offensive line and defensive line, is a liar. <laughs> that man is a liar. Okay, back to the offense. Uh, Seth McGowan, right? I think Seth McGowan. The hype is real. The kid runs hard, and he's only going to get better. I think he's going to get a little better with sensing how to set up set up his blocks. You saw him on the GT counter a couple times. Get out in front of that second puller when he doesn't need to quite. He's going to learn the patience, the tempo mm -hmm. of that play when it comes to game speed and game feel. But I think the way they want to utilize him, especially – as he continues to learn and grow here in his freshman year, they're going to continue to get this dude the ball in space. You saw it on the swing screen that went for the touchdown. Now that was blocked well. Mikey Henderson had a great block on that. Ely got out there, great block on that play. But that dude's got another gear. He's got a gear that no one else on this roster, unless Ramondre Stevenson has gotten faster, no one else has. And that is a scary thought. And, Ted, we'd been hearing things about him, and, boy, he did not disappoint, man. He did not disappoint at all. No, he's great. Um, yeah, the timing on some of those plays, you know, whenever you're in a game and the adrenaline's going, you just you feel like you've got to go all out. But he's got to wait a little bit before he really, you know, slams the throttle all the way forward and takes off. That's fine. That's going to come. They're going to coach that up. That's going to be there. But as, sure, as far as the uh, sheer ability goes, he's unbelievable, man. He'll flatten guys. He runs aggressive. He's one of those guys that runs so hard that you're kind of like – you kind of cringe every time. Like, don't get yourself hurt out there, dude. I mean, it's going to get a little bit different whenever you're playing later in the season, uh, playing some bigger bodies, some more physical players. But he's violent. And, I, you know, the way he catches it out of the backfield, I mean – He's he's probably one of the – I think he's going to be one of the bigger threats catching the ball that we've had since since Joe Mixon. I mean, we've had some guys that are capable but aren't just like home run hitters, and I think he's got the chance to be that. Yeah, and it just gives Lincoln Riley another dimension to his offense. When you have a back that basically has wide receiver hands out of the backfield, uh, I can only imagine the stuff that Lincoln's going to come up with for for him – 
as a receiver out of the backfield. I wouldn't, they don't do a ton of stuff out of empty either. And maybe he adds that into it. Like all of a sudden you see, OU getting empty and everyone's going to be like, we haven't seen well, this on film. Uh, what do we I do I know here? they've got it. Yeah. So if you, if you remember back to when Joe Mixon was here, whenever Joe Mixon was in the game as a single back, they started every single snap pretty much in empty and he'd motion back in. But then they also had the stuff where they'd snap it in empty and he'd run routes and be a part of the, of the five man scheme. But when he was in the game, they started in empty and motioned him back in the backfield. I imagine you're going to see that same deal with Seth McGowan. Yeah. And for those of you wondering why they would do that, it, it kind of, the defense is forced to show you what coverage that they are in. That's, that's why you see teams getting empty, motion the guy back to the backfield. And yeah, that's coming. There's no doubt. Now those wide receivers, Rambo, still fast. Good to see, still fast. Drop the touchdown. I know that one's going to haunt him. But he got the two other ones using the speed, had the deep one, then had the crossing route. Good read by Rattler there. Being patient, getting him the football. I, okay. Marvin Mims, do, do you think I went too overboard with what I said post game? Um, I mean, no. Okay, good. Look, look at the look at the recent history. I mean, the last three top wide receivers that have come out here have been first round draft picks. So, on the post game radio show, I said that first of all, Marvin Mims is the player I'm probably the most excited about on this entire team. That includes Rattler. But I said that he would be a first round pick and that he would leave early. I just do you regret it? No, I don't regret it. Remorse here? No, I feel better about it rewatching the game. I was like that kid looks amazing. <laughs> I mean, and then you add hit the return aspect of things. I thought he looked very comfortable as the punt returner. Yeah, don't yeah. stick Rambo back there again. Just let Mims do his thing. He 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 looks like a guy that is going to be an elite returner, but I mean, this kid's a true freshman. Ted, and I don't know if he's not already the best wide receiver on this team. I know that sounds drastic, but he's been in and out. Remember, he missed some of training camp as well. So he's been in and out. And when this guy is 100% and in, in football shape, like he was dominant in this game against Missouri State, but I'm expecting him. I think he can be the next Big time wide receiver at Oklahoma, first yeah. rounder. I mean, it's it's interesting because that was one of the positions because of some injury, because of suspension, that we looked at. It's like, man, are they going to be? They're going to be thin at wide receiver. They're going to have the right guys. And I mean, I don't think that's the case at all right now. Mims is going to be a star. Rambo is what we expected. Um, Theo Weiss is going to be really good. I mean, they're going to have some good players there. So. Um, you know, speed kills and Mims can fly. And Lincoln Riley loves guys that can fly in his offense. We've seen a big, steady stream of those guys. So I think he's got, the problem is there's only one football, Gabe. So, I mean, I, who's going to be the, the, the real star? Who's going to lead in uh, receptions? I'm not sure, but there's plenty of dangerous weapons. Yeah, and that's, that's almost what you want. You don't want defenses to be able to just lock in on one guy if you got talent all over the field. I mean, we kind of talked about that, but yeah, that's the first time I've seen Mims in person. And I've been told that the, he was going to be a special player, but I mean, he just jumped off the tape when I rewatched the game. I was like, wow. So I, I give me all the Marvin Mims stock that anyone wants to give me. One guy that I liked, what I saw from on offense was Mikey Henderson. And I, I'm not entirely sure how much of him we would have seen if Braden Willis would have been able to play in this one. But he brought an athleticism to that H-back, tight end, hybrid position, slash fullback, whatever the hell you want to call it. But I also thought that he held up well as a blocker. Like when you see him, he just looks kind of like a big running back. Mm -hmm. like wow that's a big back and then you saw him holding up pretty well in pass protection blocking on the backside in some run schemes but his ability to catch the ball 
out of the backfield, make that first guy miss, pick up big chunks of yardage. I, once again, it just gives Lincoln Riley another tool. And I, I was impressed with him because I hadn't heard much about him. And I think that was probably because you had Stogner, you had Willis, you had Jeremiah Hall out there. So how many snaps was this guy really going to get? But then with Willis being unavailable, he got to show us some things. And I, I have to imagine the coaching staff's really pleased with what they saw from this kid. Yeah, I imagine so. I think we use the H-backs better than anyone else in college football, I think. Um, it's a it's a unique position. Lincoln Riley's done a lot of really good things with it. We've got, uh, you know, we were talking about this in the broadcast. If you, when you add Mikey Henderson to the mix, you've got literally every body type you could possibly have for that position. Stogner's like a traditional gigantic tight end, and then you get a little bit smaller and more athletic as you go. You've got Hall, who's the looks like a traditional fullback. And he's like an eye formation guy and can, and can be a lead blocker. And Henderson looks almost more like a, like you said, a, a big running back, a big tailback. So they've got all the different positions covered, all the different body sizes covered there. And I think it's going to continue to be a big weapon for Lincoln Riley. I, I've talked about it a lot that, you know, as a, whenever those guys are in the huddle or on the field, you know, defensive coordinators have to have position or personnel groupings and you treat every personnel grouping different. And whenever you have those guys out there, if you have Hall, uh, Braden Willis and Stogner out there, you don't know if that's three tight ends, if it's two tight ends and a running back, two tight ends and a wide receiver, two receivers and a running back, two receivers and a tight, you don't know what it is. And you can add Mikey Henderson to the mix there. Yeah, you know, what is he? <laughs> that's what I'm saying. It's like in, as a defensive coordinator, you, it, you call it differently if they're going to have three tight ends in the box with the fullback in the backfield, right? But you have that same group, and they can come up, line up, and empty. And it's a passing formation. So, you know, it's, it, it gives defensive coordinators headaches. And, I mean, it wouldn't shock me. I mean, you don't have to worry about eligibility four tight end set I mean why not why not so I don't know I like it a lot I think it's I think it's great I think the more guys that you can have that are versatile that are kind of tweeners that defenses don't exactly know how to treat them the more you have that the better yeah Com completely with you it's going to be interesting to see how many snaps Henderson gets when Willis is available I I just think he showed some stuff I I, I was impressed now. The offensive line played pretty well when Creed was in there. I was I was impressed with him then. Uh, once he went out, looked like maybe they lost focus a little bit, a little bit, uh, didn't look as dominant as they should, especially in the run game. A lot of missed assignments in the run game once the second string guys came in. But this is a game where – you really don't learn anything, right? There's such little resistance at the line of scrimmage uh, from Missouri State. Now, some guys did get beat, got called for holding. Some guys didn't get called for holding and <laughs> got away with murder a couple on of a times. On a touchdown, which, right? On a touchdown. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's still a work in progress. Now, Anton Harrison... Andrew Rain were not available. I expect those guys to factor into the rotation when they are. So, all in all, it was okay. Since I know Bill Bedenboe the way I do, he's going to be pissed that they weren't more dominant, that they didn't finish blocks better. But this only gives him some ammo, right? to Woo. really get on them for the next two weeks because you have the bye week. He is, he's not going to take it easy on these guys. And then you're leading up to the K-State game. So played well, not well enough, not, not even close to the standard that has been set there in that room by Bill Bedenboe. So I'm sure that they're going to have a, a spirited few weeks of practice there on the offensive line. 
this is one of those games where if you don't play well, you look to the uh, film review and you're like, oh my God, this is going to be horrible. And then it hits you that, oh my God, this is a bye week. It's going to be a bloodbath at practice. I mean, it's going to be horrible. Basically so, going to play a game. <laughs> um, I'll, I mean, I agree with everything you said. I was shocked at the way they played. Now, I'm not worried in the future that offensive line is, is you know, not going to be a, a strong point of our offense. I'm not worried about that at all. I feel 100% like the, they will bounce back and, and play really good and get better as the season goes on. But with the way Coach Beanbow was, was building these guys up, which he never does, I was shocked at just how kind of average they looked, uh, average performance for them. So I, th they're going to bounce back fine. And it's crazy to say that with a group that's coached as well as they are, that's as uh, experienced as they are, to say that missing the two true freshmen, uh, you could tell, and those two guys are going to make them better. That's weird to say, but it's true. Yeah, it is weird to say, but I think you're. I I definitely think you're right. All right, Ted. Let's look at the defense. A really good performance by them. You can never really complain when it's a shutout, right? So. I'll kind of let you handle this. Let, let's start with your linebackers, your precious, precious linebackers. Thought Asamoa looked really good. Uh, dude was playing fast, physical, was good in the run game, good in coverage. And then David Aguebu may be the scariest looking linebacker on planet Earth. Oh my God. I love it. I love it. So, a couple of things, I'll start off with this. You know, I, I thought it was a good performance overall, but here's the thing. It's almost as if, like, in the contract for the game, it stated that you have to stay as vanilla as possible on offense. Yeah. And <laughs> how, how about them saving the reverse till they were down 48 to nothing? <laughs> I know. It's like, what the hell was that? Usually whenever you know you're going to face a fast athletic defense that's just, you know, chomping at the bit, it's going to be in the first drive they're going to do that to try and slow that pursuit down. Didn't happen. They were super basic, super vanilla with everything that they did, and we were able to absolutely just tee off on them. So uh, with that considered, I, I still think they, they looked really good. Asamoah is, and I've been saying this for a long time with him. A lot of people have called me stupid for saying it, but the dude, he's an NFL linebacker. Um, he is as explosive of a, of a player that I've seen in a long time. I say it all the time that he reminds me of Rufus Alexander with the way that he plays. Um, Aguebu, I thought was good. I thought he's, you know, for a first game, a true sophomore, first time ever playing. You've been playing Mike Backer for about 15 practices really really good job by him he's going to get better there's going to be some growing pains in there but he's going to get he's going to be good do, do you think he just looks so massive because he's wearing a single digit now am i being like is, is that part of the illusion because when he went out there uh what was it second series third mm -hmm. series maybe in the game on defense and i saw him i was like oh holy shit look at that kid <laughs> like you talk about a guy you want off the bus first. I mean, he looks better than Kenneth Murray. Like, well, and it's yeah. not particularly close. Like, he is gigantic. Yeah, he's two and a half inches taller and 15 pounds heavier. That's what I keep telling you. And Kenneth Murray was a big linebacker. I, I'm not afraid to admit this. There was times during that game, it had gotten a little boring, where I found myself, you know, hanging out. Now I get my own section over there, yeah. section 33. Welcome to Eichert Island, everyone. Population of <laughs> one. But I was just like staring at David Aguebu. I was like, whoa, look at that guy. That looks like an NFL linebacker. Like, and I literally, I, I found myself there like a solid five, maybe even 10 second stare at the guy. Nice. That's how good he looked. I was like, nice. ooh, now, ooh, snap I, I, out of it, Gabe. It, I think he's, I think he's, he's going to be good. There's, like I said, there's going to be some growing pains in there, but just with that size, 
to be able to butt and separate on big guards that climb to the next level. I mean, that's the hardest thing to do as a linebacker because you're, you're giving up, you know, 60, 70 pounds to a guy that usually is, you know, going to have arms maybe a little bit longer than yours, depending on who it is. And it's just the hardest thing. And it's a world you got to live in. And just having that size, that frame, those extra long arms is going to help him a ton just naturally. And the more he, the more he reps it, the better he gets at it, starts getting his leverage down. He's going to be a really difficult block. So I thought he did really good. You know, overall, that group is incredibly deep. I thought Robert Barnes came in and did some really good things. He and Meade uh, were kind of that third group that, that rotated in. I thought they both looked pretty good. And uh, I know they were missing the, the true freshman, Witter, who's had a really good camp, and he'll probably play some as well. So it's a good, deep group. We've, we've gone, in the matter of just uh, two years, uh, a group that was really thin, didn't feel good about our, our depth there at all, To I mean, we're six, seven guys deep just at the two inside backer spots. So I thought that was really good. Um, on the D-line, I thought a couple of those guys – really flashed. The penetration was really good. Now, it, like the biggest difference of the entire team from what we'll see in conference play was their offensive line. That will be by far the worst offensive line we play this year by a million miles. So you have to keep that in, in mind whenever you talk about some of this stuff. But I thought Winfrey looked really good. He penetrated a ton. He made some, some big plays back there. Thought our edge guys played really well. John Michael Terry got a start at defensive end because our numbers were so down, and I thought he did a good job. He's usually a stand-up rush backer. Um, you know, Benito was a little quiet. You know, I thought that he was going to have a big impact out there, but he was close. He was close to a couple sacks. Mm -hmm. You know, had had some pressures. It, it did a good job in some of those twist games there, uh, especially into the boundary. And yeah, but it. He didn't have – they didn't have any opportunities. <laughs> the sure. offense those guys were running, it was – I mean, that's not a – with what they were doing offensively, you didn't have a ton of opportunities for tackles for loss and sacks. I mean, also, you don't have that many opportunities for those when the other team can't get a fucking first down. I know. That's what I was, I was about to like say. Like the play count, like the snaps that you're playing. Like it's hard to rack up good stats when the other team isn't running plays. I think – and I don't know what the final count was, but at one point it was like 46. Like they had run 46 plays, and that was at the end of the game. I think that may have been – ended up being the total number of snaps they played, which, you know, that makes a huge difference. You talk about being a one edge rusher, he probably got like – five opportunities on third down to rush the passer <laughs> and probably won all of them and the Jaden Johnson kid threw it out of bounds which I felt bad for him that dude Ooh, he, got he got rocked and he was throwing the ball like you want to talk about leveling the playing field take a good quarterback and you know I don't I think he's okay I think he's he's a, a pretty good player but take a good quarterback and go put him behind a horrible offensive line and look how terrible they look. <laughs> oh, man. And it was sad. Like, I don't know if you guys could see it, but where I was, I was kind of on the visitor sideline, one of the only people over in this area. And his, it, it looked like it was his mom. Like, he had, he had a bad concussion, dude. Like, bad yeah. crying. Anyone that's ever had a really bad con concussion get super emotional. You go in this loop. You cry. You stop crying. You ask what's going on. You start crying again because you're scared and, and all these things. And he was going through the concussion loop, towel over his head. And then his mom came down. She was comforting him. I was like, oh, this is the worst. But, yeah, so I felt I, – I definitely felt bad for that kid. Now, Ted, what did you think about what we saw from the secondary? It, it seemed like the safeties were running the alley well. Some sound tackling from Pat Fields and DTY – uh, Turner Yell gets the interception on what can only be described as a, a nice arm punt. And other than that, kind of quiet when it, when we are talking about what we heard from the corners, Trey Brown wishes he would have held on that interception. But once again, these guys didn't get many competitive situations at all. No, they didn't. You know, it's weird at corner. If you go a game and we never hear your name, nothing's ever said, that's a good thing. 
if a corner's making a bunch of tackles, typically that's a bad thing. It means his guy's catching the ball all over him. So I thought Trey Brown uh, played really well. He looked really good, really aggressive, did some good stuff in bump and run coverage a couple of times. Um, you know, I thought they rotated a couple guys through that looked pretty good. Uh, Eaton looked pretty good. Jay Davis looked pretty good. But I thought Turner Yell played a really good game. He was physical. He came downhill, made some really good tackles. And here's the thing, and I've, I've talked about this as a defense a lot in, in years past. When the people in front of you or surrounding you are in the right place and doing the right thing, it's so much easier to make a tackle because you know how to miss a guy. You know where the alley is going to be. When everyone fits the run properly and you're coming downhill as a safety as a replace player, you know exactly where it's going to come out. And it's easy to make a tackle. You're, you're in a box instead of a ton of open space and you're out of position trying to make a play for someone else who was on the wrong side of a block. So whenever all those run fits are really good, it makes things easy. And, and that's what we saw all night. And uh, Turner Yell, he capitalized on that. Yeah, and that's one thing I don't I don't know kind of the ins and outs of defense like you do, Ted, but that that was one thing that stood out to me was it seemed like there was a lot less confusion. The communication was great, and then the decisiveness, you know, guys knowing exactly what they were looking at, exactly how they respond when they see that look. They they just looked like a more polished product. And I did like some of the stuff I saw from the defensive line. Perrion Winfrey looks like the real deal. Now, once again, those offensive linemen he was playing sucked. But he, he plays hard, and he's got twitch, and he's, and he's got out strength. of shape, too. A little out of shape. He's missed a ton of practice. And so I heard he had one hell of a night after the game. So we'll see if uh, anything comes from that. Hoping not. But yes. It is uh, – he's an impressive player. He no, is. he is. Um, you know, one thing I'll say, like you mentioned, like, how the communication looked sharp and I was talking about how all the run fits looked good and everyone was in their spot. You know, I don't know how it is on offense, but, you know, defensively, whenever you start off the season against an opponent that's got a new coach that is running a new offense that – you don't have a whole lot of film on them and what they're going to do. You're guessing a little bit. It ends up being what you call a camp rules week. You know, what that means is in camp, whenever you install your defense, you know, you go off of like the very basic rules, you know, three by one, two by two, where the back is offset and all these different things, like how you're going to call your blitzes, where you're going to set the front. That's all camp rules. And you've been doing that for like three weeks now or four weeks even. So whenever you play that opponent, it's not a very good opponent. You just stay with camp rules. Now, you go into Kansas State week, and it's going to be a true game plan week, and a lot of that stuff's going to change. Now we're going to set the front away from the back, or now we're going to set the front into the boundary instead of to the field. Uh, whenever it's cover three and you get this route, this week we're going to play off and, and wait for the crosser whenever, you know, in camp rules you're supposed to chase. So there's going to be a lot of things change over the next week. And if those guys continue to play fast whenever you start tinkering with things and, and changing some of the rules of your defense, that's whenever we'll know that these guys are really locked in. Yep. So it'll be a big week of practice this week for the Sooners, and then get into game week where they'll take on K-State. K-State coming to Norman. But overall, good win. You know, you'll never complain about 48 to nothing, even never. if it is against that team. Uh, one piece of Oklahoma State news. Oklahoma State moved up to number 11 in the AP poll without even playing. There, there were those teams that dropped out that were in the initial poll. And also, we had some teams lose, so... Uh, that's cool. That's nice. You think Going the Oklahoma to, State fans are saying, you think we could postpone our way into a college football playoff? Like, will we keep climbing genius. the rankings? <laughs> that would be genius. Now, they're going to play Tulsa Saturday at 11 a.m. on ESPN, and we will take a deeper look at that matchup next episode uh, since OU is going to be off. We'll look at that one. You know, two local teams. Why not? All right, Ted, let's get to the National College Football Roundup, and that is brought to you by Insurica. 
Do you own a business? If you do, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective, comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. Insurica's clients become best-in-class businesses by working with Insurica's team of advisors to manage risk. Purchasing insurance is only one way to protect your business. Best-in-class businesses win by avoiding a loss in the first place. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. I'm an Insurica client, and you should be too. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A.com. All right, let's talk about some of the other games that went down this weekend in college football. And unfortunately, uh, there's, there's no other place to start other than the Sun Belt owned the Big 12 this weekend. I do Big 12 today on Sirius XM Radio. I'm afraid I'm going to have to call it Sun Belt today all week because three wins for the Sun Belt over the Big 12. Iowa State loses to Louisiana, which was not an accident. That was not an upset. The better team won that football game if you watched it. K-State lost to Arkansas State, those tricky bastards. And Kansas, well, they got dominated by Coastal Carolina. So so what's new? Not, Teddy, not a good look, man. Not a good look at all. Oh, it's not a good look. Uh, Texas Tech barely got a win. Against and, Houston Baptist. Houston right. Baptist was going for two to force overtime, basically, late in the fourth quarter. That t- do you know a uh, trivia question for you? Do you know long? Do you know how long Houston Baptist has been a program? Um, I do not. Eight years. <laughs> They've been playing football for eight years. It, it's just you know. I thought the Big Twelve was actually going to be. A I think pretty that's right. By the way, I, d- I hope that's right. Well, Someone who cares told me if that. It's Eighty years. I mean, it, it's you still. I, I don't understand. Like, here's the, here's another thing. Baylor has rescheduled the game. They're going to play Houston next week. And I'll just tell you right now, I mean, the way things have looked, I don't feel good about that game at all. Houston's not the, uh, the best Houston has been in recent times, but hey. <laughs> They've got a ton of transfers. Holgerson has brought in a ton of guys that like were playing at power five schools. It didn't work out. He's brought them in. It's ooh, but okay. We so. do. Let me just say this. Here's how horrible of a week of college football it was. We do five picks against the spread on my other show. And I went Oh, and five and three of my picks were double digit favorites and they lost outright. I mean, Ooh. that is like, that's like hitting the lottery to be able to, uh, to miss something like that. I mean, unbelievable how bad it was. Florida State got absolutely destroyed by Georgia Tech. I mean, I don't know. Like, that's what was scary about when Oklahoma took the field. It's like, Missouri State's bad, but my goodness, some of these other games don't make you feel good about what it may look like. Yeah. So you look at, you know, you just look at the Iowa State game. I heard people saying, oh, it was, they got upset by Louisiana. Listen, if you watch that game, Louisiana had better athletes. They had more speed. They were better at the line of scrimmage. Like, that was not an upset. And I, I know that Louisiana had the kick return and the punt return for touchdowns. But, oh, this just in. Special teams is still part of football, people. So don't tell me, me like – claw my eyeballs out whenever I see this happen all the time that special teams still wins football games. Um, And it's one of my biggest frustrations with Oklahoma is that we don't take advantage of how much better our athletes are than everyone else's and go out and beat people in special teams. You go back and look at almost every loss we've had over the last five or six years. It's because of special teams gaffes and getting beat in that phase. Almost every single one of them. It makes you very mad. I know how mad it makes you. Now, 
I will say this. I watched three drives, the, the first three drives of Louisiana and Iowa State, and my initial reaction, and I even threw it out there on Twitter, Iowa State, it, j- they're just not good enough on the offensive line and the defensive line to compete with OU, Texas, and Oklahoma State. They just don't have the guys. Offensive line has been a big issue for them. Matt Campbell talks, talks about it all the time. Matt Campbell's an offensive line guy. And it's just, it just hasn't worked. I mean, he is an in-the-trenches guy. And I know it brings him pain that they're, they're not better on the offensive line and the defensive line. And Brock Purdy, who boy. What, 16 to 35? Yeah. 145 yards, one interception. It, now, his receivers didn't help him out a ton, especially early in that game. A lot of drops in key situations. But they, they just they, – they couldn't get open, really. They, they've got all those big receivers with size. But, I mean, Louisiana, they were like, okay, we're going to play man coverage. Our corners are more athletic than your receivers. <laughs> and they were right. And, I mean, Louisiana beat Iowa State. 31 to 14 and Louisiana missed two field goals like chip shots. Yeah. It should have been I'll, worse. I'll tell you. And this is a big complaint I have with college football. If you can play man to man coverage, you can destroy these offenses. These quarterbacks are so used to playing, uh, throwing zone coverage and throwing to wide open wide receivers. And just because of the nature of the game, like some of the underneath coverage, because of the RPO game and stuff like that, it's not nearly as good as it used to be. And I can understand why, because of some of the way ways that offenses play now. But man-to-man coverage is how you eliminate all of that. And if you can play man-to-man, if you trust your corners and trust your guy in the slot to play man-to-man, you can eat people alive. They don't know what – the quarterbacks don't know what to do with the ball. If you want to see what – man-to-man coverage can do to a good offense when you've got the talent, when you've got the players. There's this game that got played in Atlanta last year <laughs> called the Peach Bowl yeah. that uh, I can uh, – you, you can reference that. Now, sure. the Kansas State loss, their offensive line now, they lost all those offensive linemen from last year. And that's why I, I told you last episode, I was so interested to see them play, to see what it looked like, especially offensively. And they just couldn't run the damn ball. They, they could not run the football, so they had to rely on Skylar Thompson to win this thing throwing, which he was okay, but it wasn't nearly as good. And it, this isn't his strength. So, I mean, this is a program that runs the damn ball, but it was – now, I will say, Arkansas State, they duped their ass with – some serious trickeration. They had the double pass that went. Oh, they for actually touchdowns. tried to win the game, is what you're telling me. <laughs> yeah, and they did it not being down huge like a uh, Missouri State. So they had a double pass. They had a double reverse pass. But you, there's no excuses, right? You're at home against Arkansas State, and I, I will give Arkansas St- State credit. They had the best player on the field. That Jonathan Adams kid. Oh boy, I, I mean, he dominated drives like entire drives and I think he ended up with three touchdowns in his best catch of the day they ended up calling in complete uh, I mean it was an unbelievable one hand tap both feet and they just said the ball moved a little bit he was he was awesome but I will say this and you heard the same thing from Billy Napier as you did from Blake Anderson neither of those teams Louisiana or Arkansas State were surprised that they won those games. Neither of them. They were like, this is what we expected to happen. I was like, oh, my God, the disrespect. Well, all I'll say is thank God that TCU and SMU didn't play. Ooh. Because uh, let me tell you, that was, that was upset alert right there. Since TCU lost their quarterback, that was going to be a game that they were going to have to really pull something out to beat SMU. So how would that have looked? Um, I don't know, man. It's shocking. I thought the Big 12 was going to be better this year, but because of that week, it's going to make it even more difficult for an Oklahoma if it comes down to making the playoff. Got to go undefeated. Yeah. 
it, if it comes down to you and someone else right there in your resumes, like you're both one loss or something like that. Sorry. They're, 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 they're already looking for reasons to take someone else. Right. And the big 12 just going out in week one and, you know, just, do, do you even, do we even want to waste our time talking about the Kansas coastal Carolina? I, it was kind of fun having some Big 12 after dark. I will say that, especially when it looked like things were going to get weird. That was not offsides on that onside I, kick that Kansas recovered. They got screwed there, but they just got they, – they were getting steamrolled. They were down 28 to nothing. They were getting embarrassed on their own field by Coastal I, Carolina. I am shocked that you watched that game. <laughs> I gave up whenever it was 21 to zero. It's like, I'm not watching. Why am I? I'm not watching this. I'm Dude, doing I was on the porch drinking wine. I was feeling good. And I was like, you know what? There's nothing else on my life. My wife was like, yeah, let's watch it. And uh, now Kansas, the, J- the Jayhawks did make it a little more respectable in the second half, but the I think shot I watched to clears. The, um, American Cornhole Championship. Uh, for the seventh time <laughs> on ESPN. this summer, <laughs> ESPN. with the guys, the guys with the shirts where they look like they're NASCAR cars, just yes. ads everywhere. Yeah, I've, it's it's only the seventh or eighth time I've seen that so far this summer. But I went ahead and watched that instead of the uh, the KU game. Yeah, the the Chanticleers massacred the Jayhawks and claimed bird supremacy. That Is there was... anything better than? And I don't know if they has got there ever paid. been a worse hire than Les Miles at Kansas. Uh, Jeff Long yeah. has to just be sitting there and going, what, what was I thinking? Yeah, there's been – I can think of two worse hires uh, than Les Miles. Uh, um, David Beatty. <laughs> well, no, I was going uh, – why am I drawing a blank? Um, Charlie uh, – Charlie Wise. Charlie Wise. And uh, got, he was the head coach at Buffalo. Okay, it, so the reason I know this guy's name, he gave me – the University of Buffalo was the first offer I ever received in high school. Really? And that man's name is Turner Gill. Turner Gill. So I'll tell you what's funny. When I played at Buffalo, the University of Buffalo would use the indoor facility for practice. Oh, and yeah. And I would go out there some days and because they would, they would go uh, either before or after us. But I'd go out there and eat lunch and watch their practice. And I remember thinking that they look like a below average 5A football program. And then whenever he got hired at Kansas, I was like, what? How in the world did he get hired at Kansas? That's amazing. So I don't know. They've had worse, but less miles, not good. Yeah. He's so, done, dude. I mean, I, I don't dude, know. And I don't know. It's, something's. I, I'm not a doctor, but doesn't it seem like something's up with him? Like, I, and I'm not the first person. Like, something seems off. That's all I'm saying. That's yeah, all I'm I, saying. I I feel bad, but it's pretty evident the elevator's not going all the way to the top. I mean, yeah, uh, it's, there's there's something going on there. And here's the thing, man. I'm sorry, but this is my frustration with the Big Twelve. I mean. It's it's just it's horrible for Oklahoma. It's horrible that this the the conference doesn't hold up their end of the bargain. It's horrible for Oklahoma fans whenever it comes to a home schedule. You get you get no big games to look forward to. The biggest game of the year is Texas every year, and you got to go down to Dallas for that. Which I know everyone loves that, but you know it'd be nice in a norm. I know this year you kind of got to throw it out, but in a normal year it would be nice. If we had some huge home games, you know, not just we had to schedule a non-conference game, some big home games that, you know, the vendors and Campus Corner and people can benefit off of instead of Kansas coming to town, Iowa State, Baylor, Texas Tech. These teams are awful. I mean, they're terrible. And it just it makes Oklahoma look bad, man. It really does. Yeah. But yeah, it's a but good the, trip to the college football playoff. So there's yeah. the payoff. Hey, we win every year. That's fun. Yeah. Um, we already mentioned it, but Texas Tech, they had to stop Houston Baptist. Yes, I said Houston Baptist on a two point conversion in the fourth quarter to avoid a possible overtime. Whoa. Okay. 
Now, Clemson waxed Wake Forest. Texas beat the hell out of UTEP, as they should. Uh, Notre Dame probably didn't look as good as some people thought late. they would. Yeah, it looked better late. Ian Book didn't look that tough. But I did like what I saw well, from the Kyrie Williams kid. In, Who's that big tight end they got? Dude, they always – they always have big tight ends, right? Yeah. You just go through the laundry list of them. I remember you know, going you all the way played, back to Kyle Eifert, Rudolph. Eifert was great whenever you got whenever they came to Norman. Yeah, he he was he looked really good. Uh, I, I was watching; it was in, up on the uh, TV in the in the uh, the booth, so I was kind of watching with the sound off. You're telling me you weren't a hundred percent focused on OU Missouri State during breaks, and this was post game. Okay, <laughs> of course, of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> But, yeah, so a uh, couple pieces of news before we move on to the segments. Uh, the Big Ten presidents met Sunday to go over the latest medical information, and a vote is expected Monday on fall football. Pat Forty reported that some schools have already started setting up practice schedules in preparation for an October kickoff. Life comes at you fast, Ted, and Kevin Warren's got to be going, wait, what, what's happening? I, I just took all these arrows for you guys, and now you're going to change your mind. But maybe Ryan Day's post that straight up called out the Big Ten Conference may have just done the trick. And so I, I mean this with every ounce of my being. Let's get weird, Big Ten. Let's do this dance, baby. Yeah, I, I don't know what's going on. Um... I, the fact that they're even voting for it is is great. I'll tell you what's funny. I've got a friend that is – he's the head strength coach for Wisconsin. And so whenever I I need something from the Big Ten or what's going on up there, I text him and just the like, Dude, what's happening up there? And he's been so pissed off, and everyone is, about the leadership from the Big Ten. And there's no voice and there's – Leadership is awful, but what he texted me back, I was like, so do you think there's going to be a vote for, for fall football? Do you think it's going to actually happen? And his response was, was interesting. And I didn't even really know what to respond to. He said, I think there is going to be a vote. I think there's a chance that it does happen. Trump has been a huge help. Huh. <laughs> and I did, I was like, well, remember the interesting met, the, the phone call with Kevin Warren, the tweet. We talked about it here on the pod, but so I don't know, huh. I don't know what all has happened, like but I was like, oh, well hopefully you guys get to play. Well, so I, I don't know. Don, I don't know Donald's he's working those swing states hard, baby. <laughs> no doubt about it. I thought doing. that was fascinating politics right um and then like you mentioned earlier ted uh, baylor is going to host houston on saturday remember the baylor louisiana tech game got canceled because louisiana tech had too many people test positive houston's game against memphis got canceled because a bunch of dudes from memphis rented a party bus and, yeah. then, and then there was a covid 19 outbreak in their locker room they've had to shut it down so all these teams should have rented the party buses back in like July. Come on guys. <laughs> the layman go. theory, the layman theory. So Baylor and Houston called each other and they're like, Hey, want to play? And they're going to, and not only are they going to play, it's going to be the big noon kickoff on Fox. So and not only is it going to be the big noon kickoff, but Baylor's going to lose. I oh, mean, come on. Game one for David Aranda. Yeah. They got a lot, a lot to replace on defense. Oh boy. Do. Come on, Charlie uh, Brewer. He's, no, he's a really good coach. I mean, I, I think that I, think I like him a lot. Some, I've I've yeah. been able to interview him a couple of times over on Sirius, and he's just he's a really interesting guy. But I I'm just curious. You got Larry Fedora there as your offense coordinator. I mean, that's a guy that knows what he do. He's yeah. he is doing. I know he didn't have the best luck as a head coach there at North Carolina, but. He can call I, some offense, so we'll I we'll see. They got they're going to be pretty good, but the problem is, you know, just with, with the way this whole thing's gone down, they'd had no off season. 
they had to stop workouts, send players home a couple of different times. So I just with with what I've seen with everyone else, it's kind of hard to expect that they're going to put out some great product and go go dominate Houston. But we'll see. Well, one thing about Baylor is I, I think Dave Aranda, he's kind of like one of those mad scientist guys when when you talk to him about his philosophies on defense, like very Brent Venables vibes from this guy. And I don't think he did. I don't think he got that creative at LSU because he had all kinds Players. of athletes and he could just keep shit simple. But if you go back and you look at some of the stuff he did at, what was it, Wisconsin? I mean, it's just coming from everywhere. So I, I don't expect Baylor to be a rush three, drop eight, and keep everything in front of us type defense. I, I think it's going to get weird from Dave Aranda on that side of the ball. And I'm kind of excited for it. Yeah, I'm kind of And that's to tough, man. Whenever you've got teams that run a bunch of exotic blitzes and, and different fronts and different things that they do, it can be really difficult. But the, the flip side of that is a lot of times the guys don't know where the hell they're supposed to be. And there's a lot of screw ups and free runners out there. So uh, we'll see if he can get it coached up. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. All right, Ted, let's move on to our segments. And we're going to start with winners and losers of the weekend. Teddy's winners and losers of the weekend are brought to you by advanced weight loss clinic of sand Springs. They'll help you execute it execute a realistic and achievable weight loss plan designed for you and only you. They've got all kinds of treatments for men and women. They're licensed and trained experts combine diet and exercise with hormone therapies to maximize your results. If you're struggling with low libido or low energy, Advanced Weight Loss Clinic of Sand Springs can help with that too. They also offer Botox and fillers. To get on the path to losing weight, call 918-241-LOSE or visit their Facebook page. If you mention the podcast, you will get a free fat burner injection. All right, Ted, who do you have as your winner of the weekend? Uh, well, as my winner, I'm going to go with the virtual offseason who, uh, in a contest with the players in the NFL, won big time. Uh, I was going to go with George Kittle for signing that contract before Garoppolo tried to get his uh, career ended. By oh, that high throw. <laughs> I was like, please don't be hurt, George Kittle. You're like one of my favorite players to watch in football. I mean, he came back for the second half. He didn't catch another ball, but I mean, I don't know how that ACL is still intact. His He's got knee great was ligaments. Extended pretty bad. Great ligaments on that guy. That's the only answer. Great ligaments. Yep, great ligaments. But um, I'm going with the virtual offseason because I got to tell you, never in my life have I seen more hamstring injuries than what is going on in the NFL right now. Every single guy out there is going down with the hamstrings because they ain't been running, baby. They've been sitting around playing video games, doing some uh, bench press and curls. Those hamstrings are out of shape, and the numbers are just going to keep on coming. And I believe you called that like months ago. You were like, there's going to be so many soft tissue injuries. I mean, it's it's crazy. I mean, every single – it's pretty much every skill guy on every team is in some stage of a hamstring uh, injury. Like, either they're, they're fine and just, like, kind of nursing it, questionable, or they're out and it's not going to be – not going to be good for several weeks. Every wide receiver is questionable <laughs> hamstring. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I hope – I think we're going to continue to see a lot of injuries because I, the, the, the rules around practice in the NFL, when you don't have the actual preseason games to where you can hit some people and kind of set your pads. And you always talk about getting calloused for the season, Teddy. I just, I, I think the injuries are going to continue to add up. And the interesting part is going to be the players that get brought in to fill spots now they're probably going to pick from their own practice squad right because those guys have been getting tested but i'm just going to feel so bad for the player that comes in he's like yes i'm finally getting my chance and then he tests positive for the oh, coronavirus God. and they're like all right man see ya it's gonna happen i'm gonna feel so bad for that guy i tell you but man everyone after usually by week one in the nfl you are you're in game shape. You play four preseason games. Now, depending on 
uh, your stature as a player. Some guys have played more than others, but everyone on the team has seen, unless you're injured, has seen a, a good bit of live action. These teams have seen no live action, not even cross practices. When I tell you that those guys are going to be sore in the NFL tomorrow, Ooh. buddy, you have no idea. Ooh. It's okay, be on, brutal. On that <laughs> note, who who do you have as your loser of the weekend? Oh. oh. The loser of the weekend is fans of the Green Bay Packers. Now you might be thinking, what? They looked fantastic today. Well, yes, they did. Aaron Rodgers, after they um kind of went behind his back and picked a first round quarterback there. Uh, he went ahead and uh, prepared himself. He's prepared for that divorce. He's been on a diet. He's been working out. He's got the six pack out. He's been cutting out, cutting out carbs, no carb diet, baby. Uh, uh, fasted cardio in the morning. He's getting ready to roll. He's re getting ready to go out on the open market. He's going to rip it this season. 32 a, of 44 for four touchdowns and zero interceptions. The Packers put 43 on the Vikings in their own building. They looked great doing it. And I'm just telling you, he's going to have a season for the ages and be like, yeah, trade me. I'm not playing here. Yeah, trade Jordan me. Love. Yeah, he's ready. I'm, I'm out of here. Thanks, but no thanks. I'll see you guys later. So while it was great today, enjoy it while it lasts, Green Bay Packers fans, because he gone. Ooh, that's that's really going to make some Packers fans like really <laughs> <Traitor>. sad. <laughs> Why would you say that, Teddy? That's not what we see. It's going to retire a Packer. Jordan Love will just still trade Jordan Love. Yeah, mm. that was still weird. Should have drafted a receiver. But mm. – didn't look like they needed another hey, receiver. If they were today. trying to make their quarterback mad to go out and prove his worth. Good job because it's <laughs> going to happen, buddy. <laughs> Mission accomplished. All right. My winners and losers are brought to you by Sound Advice. A lot of us are going to be watching our favorite football teams from home this year, which is why you need to get ready for game day with a home theater system from our friends at Sound Advice. Sound Advice can customize your home entertainment system indoors or outdoors. Sound Advice did the Wi-Fi network and all the audio visual at my new house, and it is awesome. They hide all the wires and cable boxes, so it looks great, and I can control every TV in my house from my phone. Also, put it on my iPad this week, so I've Sweet. got multiple. I can do. Yeah, I've got remotes, can phone, and iPad now, so it's legit. For the best home theater systems in the Oklahoma City area, call Sound Advice at four zero five five four nine thirty eight eighty or visit soundadviceokc.com. All right, my winner of the weekend, Ted. Now, I almost went with Jameis Winston just because everyone was bringing him up because Tom Brady threw a few interceptions, and one was a pick six where I think, frankly, the arm just doesn't have enough pop left in it to make that deep out route across the field. But instead, I, I am going to go – with the Baltimore Ravens as my winner of the weekend. Woo. We gave the Cleveland Browns a chance, and my God, were we wrong. Wow. They looked – that was an absolute beatdown that they gave the Browns. Wasn't even close. Lamar Jackson is an absolute stud. He looks better than he did last year, and I don't know if you guys remember this, but he was the MVP of the league. Last year, he made some Hollywood throws. Hollywood looked good. Andrews Hollywood. looked good. Yeah. One piece of advice for the Cleveland Browns. You should cover Mark Andrews in the red zone. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is not wise to leave him wide open. Scored a couple of touchdowns. I'm sure that made a lot of the fantasy football people very happy. But once again, the Browns just, they, they didn't look great. Baker didn't look good. I, I, I don't know, man. I don't know. They just – that was a thorough ass whooping. Thorough. It was. It was. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's just so interesting because – What, what has happened to Baker's accuracy? Like, he used to be – that was the one thing when someone was like, why do you think – because when he was coming out 
you know, I had some people call me, what do you think about him as a guy? What do you think about it? It's like, and stuff like that happens all the time. They, you know, NFL people will call whoever they can find to get all of the information. And I thought he was going to be a really, really good NFL quarterback because I loved his competitiveness, but it always went back to the accuracy. Like that guy could put it exactly where he wanted to be to put it when he wanted to put it there. And I don't know if I, I don't know n- enough about quarterback mechanics, but his his accuracy is not what it was. Well, one of the reasons he was so great at Oklahoma is because he had an unbelievable offensive line. Correct. He was able to stand in the pocket forever, and his offensive line is better this year but it's been bad for the first two years of his career. And whenever you're used to playing behind bad quarter, uh, bad offensive line, you're kind of like, you're not confident in your release. You're, you're, you know, you're kind of thrown off your back foot a little bit. You're scared, scared to step into stuff. You feel like someone's always bearing down on you and the clock in your head is sped up and you're just thinking, get the ball out, get the ball out. And whenever that's the case, everything is rushed and the mechanics go, and you're not nearly as accurate. And, and that's what's gone on, man. And I'll tell you, one of the other things about Baker, and it's why he was so good at Oklahoma, is because he feeds off of his confidence, right? Once he makes a couple of plays, he just feeds on it, and he just, it just builds and builds and builds throughout a game and throughout a season. That's gone. It's not there. He's not the same guy that he was. He used to love going out there to play, and now he looks like he's just trying not to screw up. And yeah. when that happens and that sets in, God, it man, really I, affects your play. I, I really like him. I, I just hope he can turn around. I, I want him to turn around. I believe he can turn around. But we've talked about this. Case Keenum's there for a reason. He's, he's about for- as good as you can have as a guy that's going to come in – mid-season and give you really solid quarterback play yeah so baker mayfield he's he's got seven games in my opinion now maybe maybe we're being a little too dramatic but if they're one in six i don't think you're being dramatic enough okay okay it's it everyone you got to remember it's a competitive league it's a very competitive and everyone that brought him in is gone. gone. That is the biggest key right there. New head coach, new GM, all the people that, you know, had stock in him and wanted to see him perform are gone. So now when you replace the the head coach and the GM and they don't have a good season, what's the first thing they do? <laughs> it's is that guy. How am I supposed to win with that quarterback? That's the quarterback you guys gave me. We got to get my guy back in here. So that's the first thing that's going to happen. Now, they're going to do everything they can to stay behind him and, and try and get things going in the right direction. But the moment they feel like it's a lost cause, it's done. Yep. We'll see. We'll see. Hoping for the best for old Baker. Hoping oh, for the by best. By the way, though. Um, he did not look good today. Whenever you said you were thinking about going with Jameis Winston, it, was, it reminded me that, woo, New England looked good good did you so see i today? was so when you with the hamstring thing i was like i am so shocked he didn't talk about cam newton and the patriots like it, dude cam looked great he looked that great offense, running around it's gonna be tough man it's gonna be tough it looked really good it would it's it's hilarious because new england likes their linemen a little shorter i don't know if you've ever noticed this mm-hmm. but for the most part, especially the interior guys, they kind of like these short and stocky. Like, I don't know. It, it's definitely something they look for, though. Just look at look at their O-line next time you, you watch them play, and you'll be like, oh, yeah, all those guys are shaped the exact same. <laughs> and it's not an accident. But Cam Newton is the biggest human being alive, and he's he was celebrating with those interior guys. And I was like, oh, that's funny. That's funny. It's, yeah, you've got now you've got the biggest quarterback on the planet celebrating. So I missed what happened at the end of that game. What was he all upset about? I flipped it over like the game had just ended and they were all holding him back and he was all pissed off at someone. I'll have to go back and find it. Yeah, I, he's probably just not. He 
He was just mad. Sometimes you're just mad, Ted. Now, play mad, play angry. Play angry, but play under control. Harness that anger. Now, <laughs> now I think I'm thinking of that scene. Harness, in, block out block, the bat. Block bat, yeah, the scene from Happy Gilmore. Oh, okay. Uh, loser of the weekend. I, I thought about going with Mike Norvell because, ooh, Florida State apparently still a dumpster fire. They – they lose to Georgia Tech. But I, I didn't do that out of respect for Georgia Tech because I think Jeff Collins is a hell of a football coach, and he's going to turn that thing around sooner than people think. I halfway thought that the entire Florida State team was going to opt out after that game. <laughs> <laughs> they still might. It's, it's not too late. It's, it's definitely not too late. And do you see the Florida State fans? They said uh, <laughs> all the rules that they set at Doke, they were like, nope. We're hanging out. We're partying in the stands. Oh, it was it was a different scene than all the other games you saw. Okay, but so my loser of the weekend, DeAndre Swift. I I feel for Detroit Lions fans, Teddy. And both of you, both of us played for the Lions. They've got really good fans, passionate fans. And the Lions were up 17 in that game they blow that lead trubisky somehow turns into a competent quarterback throws three fourth quarter touchdowns but it's all good matthew stafford he operates a solid two-minute drill and they're going down the field and stafford delivers a perfect throw to the rookie running back from georgia deandre swift it hits him directly in the hands to win the game, and he drops it. And I felt bad for him. I felt bad for the Lions. I felt bad for Stafford. And then if you hear the radio call from the Lions guys, oh, my gosh, they were just like, oh, he, dro he dropped it. No, <laughs> it, was, it is priceless. Go find that. But, yeah, oh my God. loser of the weekend, DeAndre Swift, your rookie, playing in your first NFL game. You're a high draft pick. You've got all these expectations. You're playing well up to this point, and you drop the game-winning touchdown in a divisional game. Brutal. Have I ever told you the story of, like, how Mariucci ended up getting fired? I don't think so. So he got fired a week later, but this is what caused it. We had, we had a deep snapper that was there for a long time. I can't even remember the guy's name, but um, we brought in, his name was uh, Jody something. But anyways, we brought in, he, he had a bad snap and got cut. So they bring in a new guy who I believe is still there, Don Muehlbach. Don Muehlbach was there when you were there. He was there when I was there. He is still there. He's in like his 16th season. And he can fire a deep snap harder than anyone I've ever seen. So we bring this guy in. So in his first game, we're, and he had just been hired because another guy had a bad snap. First game, back, or first game there, um, we're down against the Minnesota Vikings. I can't remember. It was a super low-scoring game. It was like, I think it was like 17 to 10. And this is when Joey Harrington's there. Uh, Two-minute drill, touchdown as the clock expires. Like, at, like it's, the clock is on zero, touchdown. All we have to do is kick the extra point to go to overtime. We got the momentum. We're feeling good. Don Muehlbach in his first game rolls back the snap. We don't even get the kickoff. Game over, go home. And somehow he didn't get cut, and he's played there for 16 years. That was his first game. Unbelievable. So Mules, Lions fans Mules are a good used dude. to it. <laughs> Mule's a good dude. He's right. a good dude. He can fire deep snap, deep snap, but he may be the most unathletic player in the history of the NFL. Can barely that, run. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> That that really is fair. That being said, his uh, his pension and four hundred one k are going to be sick. <laughs> All right, Ted. Uh, it is it's Monday, so 
normally we would do FGTB, football guys talking basketball, of course. But since the Thunder are out, too painful. Or, yeah, it's kind of painful. Uh, it's going to be fun. Clippers, uh, Nuggets, Game Seven, uh, the Eastern Conference Finals is going to be fun. I think we're all excited for that. I, I think we're all expecting the Lakers to win it. They look like they have since Rondo came back. They look like they've taken it to another level. But we're not going to do FGTB. We are going to put that on the shelf for now. And we're just going to continue to wet the beak, although we had a uh, rough, rough weekend. Now, wet the beak is brought to you by Tim Hughes Custom Hughes. Custom Hughes. <laughs> That's funny. Custom Homes. Are you looking to build your dream home? If so, Tim Hughes is the man you're looking for. Tim Hughes Custom Homes is a one stop shop for all your home building needs. He can find you a lot, he can find you an architect, he'll find you financing. And of course, he can build your dream home exactly the way you want it. Sounds too good to be true, right? Well, Tim found my wife and me a lot. He found us an architect and built our new house. Tim and his team were so easy to work with, and they just replaced our washer and dryer. We didn't like it. He was like, I got you. Going to replace it. Boom. Snap of the fingers. Gone. New ones. Let's go. Let's go. Whirlpools now. Ah. Speed, the Speed Queens were supposed to be awesome. This thing wouldn't even dry towels, Ted, and I uh. gave it a chance. Everyone was wow. like, get a speed queen, get a speed queen, get a speed queen. They got us the nicest speed queens, and they sucked. Maybe we got a bad batch, but we got some reliable whirlpools now. They're rolling perfectly. I'm a little off on this ad read. Tim and his team were so easy to work with. He also builds several office buildings. So if your business is looking to build a custom office, Tim Hughes is your man. You can see Tim's custom builds throughout Gallardia, Nichols Hills, Oak Tree, Stone Mill, and Rose Creek. It is a great time to build the house of your dreams. For more information and to see Tim's spectacular work, visit his Instagram page at, at Tim Hughes Custom Homes or visit TimHughesCustomHomes.com. All right, we are going to wet the beak with the double header from Monday Night Football. First game. And I think this is the one that Herb Street and Fowler are calling, right? First game Steelers at Giants. Uh, the Steelers are five and a half point favorites. We're about to see if all that bullshit that Joe Judge has been doing works. He made him restart a practice, which that happens in high school and college, typically not in the NFL, but I I am I think we're all excited to see if Big Ben can throw it farther than 10 yards coming <laughs> off the elbow injury. Now, I'm not sure if the Giants offensive line can handle the Steelers front. If you remember the Steelers, that front set of them, they led the league in sacks last year. They can really get after the passer. So we'll see what Daniel Jones can do. So I, I just really don't know. But give me the Giants and the five and a half. And I know, I know. Uh, yeah, I'm okay. putting my faith in the New York Giants. But I think Judge, Joe Judge, their new head coach, being such an asshole, is going to be good for them because I think they'll make less mistakes. If there's one thing we saw on Sunday, the teams that looked sloppy and made a lot of mistakes, undisciplined, they struggled. Joe Judge has been doing some things that normally don't happen in the NFL, but maybe we'll see that manifest itself in a positive way from the Giants. So, I, I'm going to go with the Giants. Give me the Giants in the five and a half. And one thing, Daniel Jones, he's also, he's going to have all of his weapons, which is important. And I can't wait to watch Saquon Barkley. I love watching that guy play football. But I'm going Giants, Ted. I know I'm crazy, but give me the Giants. Uh, you're not crazy. Can you name the two or the last two assholes the New York Giants had as head coach? Bill Parcells. Correct. And then how recent is the other one? Pretty recent. Tom Coughlin. Oh, yeah. He is yes. legendarily huge asshole. Yes. Two of them. What do those two coaches have in common? They have big, fat Super Bowl rings. Yes. Nicely done. So, Thank you. Ass Thank you. asshole coach typically does well for the Giants. So, that's a good theory there. Um, and I think they're probably going to get to a point this year where they're a really good football team. But I really like the Steelers this year, man. I so really do. I. do. Damn it. 
I shockingly took them as the AFC representative in the Super Bowl, which um, I if went Big back ben and looked at the. Gets back to, I mean, if he plays at the level that he played at two years ago, I mean, there's no doubt they've got what it takes. That defense is a problem. Right. Yeah. He, I mean, he's lost a ton of weight. He had that surgery. He says that his arm is so much better after it. And he uh, allegedly it, stopped watching so much pornography, so the arm's going to be fresher. I don't know what to think about that. I mean, I want him to be on Maybe his game. Maybe the juices will be <laughs> pent right. up. I don't know if that's good or bad. I, I don't, don't know. know. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But, I, I mean, I, I like the Steelers, man, and I like them early on. Whenever you've got experience there and That's a good the, point. The, key yeah, to your def- the key to your team is defense, then I like you early in the season. But, you know, with the weapons that the Giants have, it wouldn't shock me at all. Now, Saquon Barkley, I don't know, you know, he w- used to catch about 15 checkdowns a game from checkdown Manning, Eli, but I don't know if he's going to get the same amount with, with Jones. But he's still an absolute beast. Yeah, he's I, I'm sure I'm, I just can't wait to see those thighs. Wait, what? <laughs> what did I say? All right, the uh the second game in the doubleheader, Titans at Broncos. The Titans are a three point favorite. The Broncos, I assume they are going to get a big old dose of Derrick Henry. I don't know if you saw Mike Vrabel getting on the plane for the game, but the <laughs> mask did. said, what was it? Give the damn ball to Derrick Henry or something yes. like that on his mask, which is fantastic. But let's not forget the Titans signed Clowney. So that is significant. Also a good storyline. Jarrell Casey, who was a Titan for his entire career, really good player. He got traded from Tennessee to Denver and has not hid the fact that that bothered him. He's talked about it publicly. He's talked about it this week. So I'm excited to see him play for the Broncos. I like Tennessee in this one, even though they're going to play in altitude and, you know, what kind of shape will the guys be in all those things. I know Drew Locke, they're high on him. They're expecting him to be the man now in Denver. They felt like they found their guy, but I just think the Titans are tougher. I think they're tougher, and I'm not sure how Denver is coming. I don't, I don't know how they are mentally with the Von Miller injury. Uh, I think that's something, especially early. It may take them a while to shake that off and after something like that happened to your star player. So I think the Titans are carrying a ton of confidence into this season. I think they're going to run it down Denver's throat, and I like, I like the Titans in three. Give me the Titans. I do too. Lay the points. I think the Titans go in and win this one handily. Now, uh, whenever you rely on your defense and your running game, you can absolutely dominate a football game and win it 14 to 10, and the other team has absolutely zero chance to ever win it. I think they'll probably score more points than that, but I think it will be a super low-scoring affair. There's a chance that Derrick Henry could go off and that offense could put some points up there, but give me the Titans. Too good defensively. I think the the real weakness for the Broncos is that offensive line, right? And Tennessee's just going to chew them up, be all over the young quarterback. And I like him. I think he's going to be good, but he's going to be under constant duress in this football game. Yeah. So we both like Titans, and then we're split, even though I probably should change my mind. But I won't. I will go with my first instinct, and I'm Never riding with it. the Giants. Never change it riding with the Giants. All right, Ted, let's finish up with keeping it local. Everyone's favorite segment where we highlight what's going on in the great state of Oklahoma and keeping it local is brought to you by Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School. As schools are reopening in the fall, parents want to provide the best possible educational experience and spiritual development for their children. There's no better place for that than Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School. A one-on-one iPad setting makes McGinnis students fully prepared to continue high-level learning from home. A 12-to-1 student-to-teacher ratio guarantees no student is overlooked. In addition to athletic programs and clubs, Bishop McGinnis' college prep curriculum offers 22 AP courses. Financial aid is available. For more information, visit bmchs.org. Okay, I read a really interesting article by Steve Lackmire in the Oklahoman. And it has to do with the Cox Convention Center. Are you familiar with 
the Cox Convention Center in all of its glory. Have have you ever had the pleasure, Teddy? Yeah, I I love Cox. I've been there before. It's uh it's fantastic. Definitely going to use that sound bite. <laughs> Just that clip. No <laughs> doubt. But uh, yes, uh I it's a it's a cool spot. They redid it. It's really nice on the inside. They host uh, quite a few things in there. It's it's a pretty good venue. Yeah. So agreed, but they've built that really nice convention center as part of the last maps. The one that's right next to Scissor Tail Park, it's going to be awesome, spectacular, and it's going to be great. It's getting close to being done. At least the exterior is. I saw them putting the landscaping everything up. It's, it looks really good. You know it's close when the landscaping goes in. That's Learn right. That. when you start to get excited. Learn that when, I built, when we built our new house. Now, so the article by Steve Lackmeyer basically said that the Cox Convention Center – just might be getting transformed into a movie and television production studio, which I started reading. And I was like, I'm going to continue to read. This has my interest. So Rachel Cannon and Matt Payne, an actress and a screenwriter, respectively, who both went to OU film school, they want to convert it into five sound stages. So they're asking the Oklahoma City Council to let them negotiate deals to make that happen. And I guess people need places to film. And with the new convention center uh, next to Scissor Tail opening, you know, the Cox Convention Center, probably not going to have that much of a convention center purpose. So not going to get much use. So might as well not waste the space. And it just led me to one question. Teddy, I was like, okay, well, does this, you know, I guess I could have been like, oh, well, how does streaming affect things and like, you know, tax breaks and stuff and all the stuff going on in California. And I was no, 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 that's probably where my mind should have gone. But my first thought, are we going to turn your son into a childhood actor if this happens? Because uh, I feel a, like he's built for it. That's a good question. He sings alexander hamilton uh from the hamilton play and he's he's not bad at it it's decent he's now uh, you also you also were singing some sort of song uh, it was raining tacos or something yeah he you were singing sing that, that during too. the pregame show it's raining tacos gabe it is which sounds great right but we listened to that on repeat on the way to school in the morning, and then it stuck in my head the rest of the day. And it's shocking. I tweeted this out the other day. It's like a stupid, like a minute and a half long song. It's raining tacos. You can imagine how dumb it is. And it's got like 50 million views on YouTube. I don't understand the world that I'm living in anymore. I just I don't, don't understand people. <laughs> uh, child star possibly i was thinking more that i could maybe be a stunt man is jason statham still doing uh action movies Ooh, you could be a body double for statham yeah. now you're better looking than him but you could be a well, body thank double. you thank well you. i had to say that you're you're my Appreciate partner that. i could be an extra maybe in, what, in something or okay what happens is how would we feel about that because what happens if oklahoma city becomes like a you know, kind of like a cool place to, and I know they filmed some stuff in the state of Oklahoma already now, and it's been, it seems like it's been happening more and more, but that would be great for the city, right? You turn it oh, into like yeah. a mini, like place where people come and film stuff. I'm all for that. That'd be badass. Buy stock in any of the local catering services because they cater their asses off at those uh, studios. So I think it'd be great. I mean, it gives you a little, I mean, Oklahoma City has done a great job. You know, 20 years ago, it was an oil and gas economy, and that was like a, a huge percentage of, of what was going on. But there's a lot more to Oklahoma City these days. Still big in oil and gas, and that's great. But, uh, you know, there's there's some other stuff happening here, and that's that's good. And if you could add... Uh, film and TV or whatever it is to that list, they could be great for sure. Yeah. Oklahoma City, mini Hollywood. I can see it now. I can there see it go. now without all, without all those weird Californians. 
you could Airbnb your house to Brad Pitt for six months while he films his next big movie. I would let I would let Brad Pitt. I would kick me and my wife out of our master bedroom Just and stay in the guest room. Hey, yeah, you, you got it. it. You got it. It's yours, man. You get, if you need me to do your laundry, we just got new washer and dryer. They're great. Yeah, yeah. Whirlpools, American made. They work really well. They're easy to use. Stupid speed queen. I think those are American made too. But they, I, I don't know why it wouldn't dry towels, Teddy. And I gave it a chance, and I was like, okay, maybe it's just got to warm up or something. I think we just I got think a bad. Batch. I've got the same. I think I've got the same one, except their Electrolux, which I think is the like the exact same thing as Whirlpool. Uh, it's, but it's, I don't know. It's one of them. It's is either. It, that sounds Whirlpool. luxurious. Is it's Lux not. like luxurious? Electra it's, Lux? I think it's like the ones that they send overseas or something. I don't know, huh. but they're good. They've been great. Well, we, I just, I just did my first batch of laundry with the Whirlpools. It's in the dryer right Dry now. Dry towels? <sighs> We're about to find out. How pissed are you going to be? I will be world-class pissed if those towels aren't dry. Okay, we we do we are going to bring this back and I forgot about it during the game recap, but during each game recap we're going to take one Twitter question uh off the podcast Twitter and let's go with this one. This one comes from Dylan McDaniel at Dylan1933 on Twitter. Ask Teddy which linebacker impressed him the most. Oh boy. That's a good one. I thought Osamoa was great, but I expected that. So I'm a little hesitant to say him. Um, I thought Aguebo did really well for his first game at Mike Backer. I thought Deshaun White played well, too. He's kind of lost in the mix. I thought he had a really good game. I'll probably go with Osamoa um, just to see him, the confidence that he's got. Uh, he understands where to be in this defense. Just the quick twitch, the way that he he can be so aggressive, it's it's fun to watch him play, man. He is a big play machine. Yep. All right. Well, I I will I'll put that question in the right spot next time when we do the recap. That's perfect. That's on me. All right, Ted. Episode forty two in the books. Our first football episode, baby. Let's God, go. It, felt it only so took forty two. It only took forty two. It felt so good felt so good we'll have a new podcast that'll drop thursday just a reminder you can hear teddy from two to six on sports talk 1400 and you can hear me on sirius xm big 12 radio channel 375 hope you all have a great week until next time we appreciate y'all for listening and do what you always do oklahoma